chapter thirty nine of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter thirty nine in modern greece how would you like to make a trip into fairyland there is a little country not far from constantinople from which have come some of the strangest stories ever told there are stories of huge giants who breathed forth fire and flame who were conquered by hercules stories of pegasus a horse which had wings so that it flew through the air carrying its master over mountains and seas stories of io a beautiful maiden who was turned into a snow-white cow through the jealousy of the goddess juno and stories of the soldiers of ulysses who among their other experiences were changed into swine by the wicked witch circe there are stories of gods and goddesses of sweet singing sirens of horrible harpies who were half bird and half woman of centaurs who were half horse and half man so many strange stories in fact that i must not stop even to mention them all you may read of them perhaps in the poems of homer who lived there several thousand years ago or in the tanglewood tales and wonder book of our own nathaniel hawthorne who has retold these old stories in a beautiful way this wonderful land is greece it is a little country consisting of some mountainous islands and the mountainous peninsula which extends from the foot of the balkan peninsula between the aegean and ionian seas greece is only about as big as our state of west virginia and it is so wild and rugged that most of the land cannot be cultivated but it has nevertheless been one of the most important countries of the world it was the birthplace of our civilization when the rest of europe was inhabited by savages and wild animals greece had cities and towns and cultivated farms it had many little republics each with its own government and its own laws the greeks were then noted for their strength and beauty and they often held public games where the men and boys from everywhere came to try who was the strongest and most skilful they were artistic and they built some of the grandest temples and carved some of the most beautiful statues the world has ever known they were learned they had famous orators poets and scholars and their language was so beautiful and their methods of thinking so clear that the literature of ancient greece has always been a source of inspiration to scholars everywhere it is still studied in the colleges all over the world the ancient greeks became a great commercial nation the country has many excellent harbors so that its people naturally have always taken to the sea their huge boats propelled by triple banks of oars went to all parts of the mediterranean sea exchanging the choicest products of greece for those of other lands they became so rich after a time that other nations made war upon them they resisted the attacks of the persians but were conquered later by the romans who readily assimilated greek culture and refinement and in time carried the greek civilization with them along the rhine and to all parts of southern europe hundreds of years later this same civilization developed and modified somewhat by the different peoples that transmitted it came with our forefathers to north america so that the little country of greece was really the originator of much of our own manners and customs and thought all this however came from the ancient greeks who lived long before christ was born since that time the country has been conquered again and again and its people have been so oppressed and ill-treated by their savage victors that it has at times become almost barbarous the goths overran it during the middle ages and when the turks captured constantinople they took possession of it and ruled it in their miserable way until shortly after the beginning of the last century when the greeks rebelled and through the assistance of some of the great nations of europe became an independent people they have now their own parliament elected by themselves and a king who is a descendant of the royal family of denmark and they are rapidly improving in civilization and wealth as we shall observe during our travels among them we have left constantinople by steamer and have come to athens the capital of greece what a beautiful city it is and how modern it has many magnificent buildings of the purest white marble and thousands of two 
three and four-story homes of brick covered with stucco the walls of the houses are either white or of the most delicate pinks blues and yellows so that we seem to be in a city of many colored marbles roofed with red tiles the streets are paved with cobbles and the sidewalks with flagstones there are palaces with gardens about them and parks filled with trees and beautiful flowers the business sections look like those of an american town and the stores have plate glass windows displaying all sorts of beautiful goods do you hear that locomotive that shrill whistle announces the arrival of the steam cars from the piraeus the seaport of athens which is over the plain about five miles away and that bell that you hear is rung by the conductor on that street car over there by which we can ride to any part of the city we thought we were coming to one of the oldest places of the world but we seem to be in one of the newest until we take a stroll outside the town through the ruins which are lying about on every side we realize still more that we are on the site of old athens when we climb the acropolis this is a gigantic block or hill of rose-colored stone which rises almost straight up above athens on the edge of the city upon its top there is a plateau of about ten acres covered with broken columns marble statues and the remains of the most wonderful buildings of ancient greece here are the ruins of the parthenon the great columns which once upheld the roof of that beautiful temple still rest on their pedestals here was the statue of athena the goddess of war which was thirty-eight feet high and made of ivory and gold near the parthenon are the ruins of another temple with a portico upheld by tall grecian maidens in marble and there are so many other wonderful ruins to be seen outside athens and in other parts of greece that it would take many months to explore them we are more interested in the greeks of today notice for instance that man driving some goats who is now coming toward us he is dressed in short skirts and tight trousers with an embroidered jacket which comes to his waist he has red shoes with black tassels as big as a chestnut burr on the toes and a red nightcap on his head he is one of the milkmen of athens and lives in the country near by see he has stopped at that house over there and is kneeling beside one of his goats he is milking it for the servant girl who stands by his side and looks on the most of the athenians drink goat's milk and to be sure they get it fresh and unwatered they insist that the goats be driven from house to house and milked at their doors do you want a ripe orange or some figs fresh from the trees if so you can buy them cheap of that greek boy coming down the street he is driving two little donkeys loaded with baskets of fruit greece has many fine fruits it has the most delicious of oranges and they are so cheap that we can buy all we can eat for a very few cents but perhaps you desire something sweeter well in that case we shall call over that old woman who is walking along on the opposite sidewalk behind the fruit peddler she has a thick comb of honey fastened to a branch in her hand it is the honey of hymettus and it was gathered by the bees from the yellow flowers which grow on the mount of that name it has a delicious flavor the honey of hymettus has been noted for ages greece is a land of sweet-smelling honey-filled flowers and the bees work as hard here as anywhere else in the world but look at that boy who is coming out of the street at the left he is carrying a big dish of smoking roast meat behind him comes a girl with a plate of baked fish sprinkled with onions and farther back are several children carrying loaves of hot bread and other things fresh from the fire where can they be going they must be on their way to supply some great public dinner no each child is carrying only the food for its own family the dishes were dressed at home and taken to the baker to be cooked in his oven at so much a dish the greeks have small kitchens and their ordinary cooking stove is not fitted for roasting and baking it is a brick or stone ledge built about three feet high against the wall with several small holes in the top each hole has a grating and an opening below it in the side which furnishes the draught upon the grating a little charcoal is put and the fire is made hotter by fanning only boiling and stewing can easily be done on such stoves so when a family has a large roast it sends it out to the baker 
if we follow those boys and enter their houses we shall discover that the poorer greeks live very simply many families have but two rooms one often serving as dining room bedroom and kitchen some of the houses are built around courts without yards or gardens the better classes have homes much like those we saw in berlin vienna and paris they live in apartments or flats a number of families in the same house only the rich having separate houses we see all sorts of peddlers as we go on with our walk there are men with lemonade and candies and men peddling onions and garlic which they have woven together in ropes and sell at so much a string there are men driving turkeys along from house to house so that the customers may pick out the turkeys they want from the flock there are men in skirts and red caps riding on horses and donkeys and men women and children dressed as we are in carriages driven by coachmen in skirts and red caps there are private soldiers wearing the jackets and petticoats which form a part of the national uniform and smart-looking officers in suits of white linen there are many priests dressed in black gowns and high caps which remind us of the churches of russia for the greeks and the russians have much the same faith and nearly all here belong to the greek orthodox church there is a great deal of business done on the streets we see women wearing the long loose gowns of the country knitting outside their houses and shoemakers pegging away on the steps there are cafes everywhere with tables outside them surrounded by men who are playing dominoes while they chat and drink coffee the coffee is black and costs two or three cents a cup some of the men are very excited they are talking politics for these people are great politicians and even the waiters at the hotels and the drivers on the street cars think they know just how the governments of the whole world really should be run the greeks have their own political parties and elect the parliament which makes all their laws they are patriotic and very proud of their progress since they became free of the turks they have built hundreds of miles of railroads they now have public schools all over greece which all children are required to attend the greeks are fast becoming well educated the boys and girls are anxious to learn and we shall meet few who cannot read and write the school books are in the same characters that the ancient greeks used and it is not uncommon to hear a boy recite the tales of homer in the original or repeat the orations of demosthenes a famous greek orator who lived over twenty-two centuries ago athens has again become a seat of learning it has a university with thousands of students a girls college which is one of the largest and best of the far east and many scientific institutions fifty different newspapers and periodicals are published most of them in the greek text many of the people speak several languages and we frequently meet girls and boys of eight and ten years who address us in english we learn that scholars come here from all parts of the world to study the ruins of old greece and the wonderful collections in the museums and we spend some time at the american college where students from our own country come to study greek literature and art we are surprised at the wealth of athens and at the extent of grecian commerce and trade the ports are crowded with shipping the country has several hundred merchant steamers and more than three thousand sailing vessels in addition to numerous coasters owing to the excellent harbors and the nearness of all parts of the country to the coast many of the greeks become sailors and greek ships now do a large part of the business of the black sea and the mediterranean the greeks almost monopolize the trade of this part of the world they have established greek banking houses and stores at all ports of asia minor and egypt and at the chief cities along the black sea and the aegean sea there are many more greeks living outside greece than at home there are about eight millions of them in the world and only a little more than two millions live in greece the others having gone abroad as sailors or to engage in commerce they are so successful as traders that it is a common saying in the countries about the eastern side of the mediterranean sea that one greek is equal to two jews at a bargain and everyone knows that the jews are shrewd traders but suppose we leave athens and take a trip across the peninsula to corinth where we can get a vessel which will land us in italy 
we go by rail stopping now and then at a station for a drive off into the country how beautiful everything looks the sky is bright blue there is a silvery tinge to the mountains and the shadows of the fleecy clouds make patches of dark blue velvet on the silver-gray hills we pass through fields of wheat barley and rye in which great blood-red poppies are growing we go by orange groves where the yellow balls peep at us out of the green foliage and see thousands of gnarly olive trees with the plum-like fruit ripening upon them there are fine-looking men and women at work in the fields gathering the crops they are cutting the grain with sickles and scythes and tying it into sheaves with their hands nearly all the farming is of the rudest description the fields are hoed or spaded instead of being ploughed and all the seeds are sown by hand there are many small farms and the farmer in most cases owns the land that he tills as we near corinth we enter a region of vineyards and should we go on south across the corinth peninsula we should see hill after hill covered with vines it is these vineyards that yield the zante currants the seedless grapes or raisins which are shipped to all parts of the world they form the chief export of greece and bring in many millions of dollars a year shiploads of them go to the united states and i doubt not every one of us has eaten them again and again in puddings and cakes they are not much bigger than peas but they have such a delicious flavor that there are no other grapes equal to them and they grow best right here near corinth it is from corinth that their name currant comes and our currants although they are a different fruit were probably named after the zante currant on account of the similarity in size and appearance we see the people picking the grapes hundreds of men women and children are gathering them and lying them out on trays to dry in the sun after drying they are packed up in boxes and crates and then sent to patras and other ports end of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter forty venice we take ship at corinth and steam out through the gulf of patras into the mediterranean sea the sky is bright the water is a deep blue and in the bright sunlight the mountains seem to be dusted with silver we sail in and out among the ionian islands and then turn to the north and are soon going through the strait of otantro into the adriatic we sail up this long narrow sea for two days coasting by albania and the independent little country of montenegro and on the third morning find ourselves at anchor in front of a great city which seems to rise up out of the waves there are thousands of buildings apparently resting in water which flows through the streets and washes the walls of the houses there is water to the right and water to the left between the city and the shore and by climbing up the mast of our steamer we can look over and see water behind the city and still the shore is everywhere but a few miles away it is low and marshy on the water's edge but farther back the land rises and away off in the distance is a wall of high mountains their peaks covered with snow those mountains are the italian alps the other side of which we explored while in switzerland and the country off which we are lying extending hundreds of miles to the westward and southward is the great kingdom of italy which we are now to explore the city in front of us is venice the queen of the adriatic a mighty port which has grown up on about one hundred little islands away out here in the sea the islands have bridges connecting them they are covered with houses and are so cut up by canals that the water itself seems to form the foundations of the city the canals are the streets our steamer sails up into one of the wildest of these water highways it is the grand canal an avenue of water wider than one of the boulevards of paris filled with barges launches and all sorts of queer little boats moving to and fro in venice almost all the traffic is carried on by boats there is not a dray a cart nor a carriage in the whole city there is not a cow nor horse there are not even the little donkeys of which we saw so many in greece the hucksters and vegetable peddlers 
go about in boats from door to door stopping under the kitchen windows to cry out their wares the cargo from the steamers is taken in barges to the factories and warehouses people go calling in boats and many of the children use boats in going to and from school the houses rise abruptly from the canals and you can step from your house right into your boat there are no front yards back yards or side yards and a venetian boy never swings on his father's front gate the streets are usually back of the houses they are narrow stone pavements bordering the canals and are for foot passengers only they wind in and out crossing the canals by bridges so arched that boats can pass under them and in our walks we shall be always going up and down hill but see those odd-looking boats coming out to the steamer they are long and narrow and turned up at the ends with a little cabin in the centre they are painted black and the only sign of colour about them is in the bright cushions which can be seen through the cabin windows those are gondolas the water cabs of venice in which we shall make our trips through the city at the stern of each boat stands the gondolier who is sculling it along with an oar which he twists from side to side swaying to and fro as he does so we motion to one of them to come to the ship and give us a ride through the city the gondolier moves his boat to the gangway he helps us aboard and we step inside the cabin he then takes his place at the stern and we soon hear the splash 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 of his oar as he sculls us on through one street after another we move up the grand canal among craft large and small past palaces which have been turned into hotels and warehouses by great factories with humming machinery and on by the homes of the people where families are sitting out on their balconies chatting and enjoying the air now we are floating under the parlor windows of a magnificent house and the music of a piano comes down to us we hear the soft strumming of a guitar in the hands of one of a pleasure party rowing toward us while the cries of hucksters peddling vegetables fish and fruits from other boats sound loudly over the water we tell the gondolier to turn into the smaller canals and are soon floating through alleys so narrow that we can touch the stone walls on either side the high houses shut out the sun and the water seems black in the shadows while our walled road is roofed with a strip of blue sky what a lot of strange things are going on in the canal we see men and boys in swimming suits diving down into the water and floating about here are the playgrounds of the children every boy in venice must learn to swim and the little ones take to the water like ducks there is a boy now diving out of the side window of his house and there is another crawling about of the water to the front door there are women washing clothes on the steps of their houses and drying them on the roofs or on ropes stretched from one house to another across the canals farther on are some children in boats and beyond them are passenger boats going from one part of the city to another leaving the smaller canals we come again into the grand canal our gondola rocking up and down in the waves of the larger boats passing near it we stop for a moment to look at a great marble bridge which crosses the canal from one island to another this bridge is the rialto one of the most famous bridges of the world it is more than three hundred years old and was formerly noted as one of the business centers of venice it swarms with foot passengers from daylight to dark it is so wide that shops have been built upon it and passing over it is like going through the aisle of a department store where men women and children are shopping we buy some oranges of the fruit peddlers at the end of the bridge and then step down into our gondola and glide onward past some of the finest buildings of the city to the hotel our hotel is in one of the old palaces we walk up marble steps and go into wide halls floored with mosaic our bedroom is enormous it has a stone floor and its walls and ceiling are covered with paintings so that angels and cupids are looking down upon us from above as we awake in the morning almost all the houses of venice are built of stone brought in ships from the mainland in many instances cedar piles were driven down into the sand to make the foundations as in amsterdam and st petersburg and upon them these great stone structures were built 
on account of the dampness stone and cement are still used for the floors layer after layer being put on until a thick floor is formed the last layer is composed of fine bits of colored stone carefully fitted together and so rubbed down that it forms a mosaic as smooth as polished marble or glass venice is celebrated for this sort of stonework the venetians make not only floors and walls of mosaic but also the most beautiful jewelry and pictures one picture often containing thousands of bits of colored stone and glass so fitted together that you cannot see the joints and might suppose that the colors were put on with a brush we spend several days in studying the industries of venice we visit the glass works the mosaic works and the factories where they are weaving beautiful silks and cloths of all kinds we frequently go to the square of st mark's to look at the famous cathedral and the four bronze horses which stand high upon its front and also the famous bronze lion on a tall column near by when i said there were no horses in venice i meant only flesh and blood horses the horses of st mark's are of metal and hence do not count yet they have probably travelled more than any live horses you know they are supposed to have once adorned one of the triumphal arches of nero the emperor of rome the romans considered them so beautiful that they took them to constantinople when that city became the capital of the roman empire later venice conquered constantinople and brought the horses back here when napoleon overran italy he carried them to paris there they remained until he lost his empire when they were brought back to venice the square of st mark's is the largest square in the city and about the only place where there is much room for strolling about it is walled on three sides by buildings which seem one vast marble palace blackened by age and the weather with this square in the centre on the other side of the square is st mark's cathedral the lower stories of some of the buildings are occupied by shops and cafes which open out upon arcades where in the evening thousands of men women and children walk to and fro there are tables and chairs in the square and people sitting at them eating ice cream and drinking coffee chocolate or wine while they listen to the music of the military bands which play there four nights a week more interesting than this is an event which occurs every afternoon at just two o'clock when grain is scattered over the stones and the pigeons come by the thousands from all parts of the city to eat it we are late in arriving and find the square filled with these beautiful birds we buy a little bag of corn from an old woman peddler and throw out several handfuls stooping down as we do so the pigeons swarm over us they light upon our heads shoulders and backs and even eat from our hands we must be careful how we treat them for if we should kill one we might have to go to jail for six months this feeding the pigeons is one of the old customs of venice the people love them for it is said that once when the city was in danger it was saved by a letter brought by a carrier pigeon at another time we are told venice gained a great victory over its enemies by information obtained in a similar way we spend some time in wandering about st mark's cathedral which is one of the finest of europe and then go through the palace of the doge in which the venetian council set centuries ago when the city was a republic from the second story of the palace we cross the canal to the prison near by upon the bridge of Sighs. it is a covered stone passageway through which the criminals came to be tried and punished we stop here a moment while our guide reads the verses from byron's poem which refer to the city i stood in venice on the bridge of Sighs a palace and a prison on each hand i saw from out the waves her structures rise as from the stroke of some enchanter's wand a thousand years their cloudy wings expand around me and a dying glory smiles o'er the far times when many a subject land looked to the winged island's marble piles where venice sat in state throned on her hundred isles even the foundation of venice is interesting it was started by the veneti who lived near the coast on the mainland when the barbarians under attila came over the alps into italy and took rome the veneti fled for refuge to these sandy islands 
and here built their little homes at first they caught fish and sold them they evaporated the salt from the water and after a time built up a great business in fish and salt which were then in even greater demand than at present as they grew richer they began to trade in other things they sent out merchant vessels and soon became the chief commercial people of the mediterranean their islands were situated at the head of the adriatic sea hither goods could be most easily brought by water to be sent across the low passes of the alps this gave the venetians a great trade with northern europe their ships soon went to all parts of the mediterranean sea and the black sea and in time out through the strait of gibraltar to england france holland and belgium in the middle ages the fine goods from asia were brought overland to the mediterranean ports and thence shipped to venice from here they were carried across the alps to the rhine and from there to all parts of northern europe other goods were sent back in exchange and venice increased in wealth factories of various kinds were established and as the venetians were skilful their city soon became a noted manufacturing centre it grew more and more powerful and in the fourteenth century it was an independent republic it had its own army and navy and made war on other cities and took some of them its merchants were among the richest of that time and they owned three thousand trading vessels which carried their goods to all parts of the known world this was at the time of the crusades when all europe was excited because jerusalem and the tomb of our saviour were in the hands of the mohammedans and armies of soldiers were formed to go to the holy land to redeem the city one of the best ways thither was by way of venice so that for many years a stream of soldiers poured through the city adding thereby to its wealth it continued to grow until the route to india around the cape of good hope was discovered after that it was found that goods could be brought more cheaply from asia by sea and the trade of venice began to decline the discovery of the new world by columbus was another blow to the prosperity of the city for this brought the atlantic ports into prominence and now there are several ports on the mediterranean which have more commerce than venice and scores of cities in the world which are richer and more powerful venice has now less than two hundred thousand people although it has grown through the opening of the suez canal by which it has regained some of its asiatic trade a railroad has been built which connects it with the mainland and goods from asia now come by way of the canal to venice and are sent on through the tunnels in the alps to central and northern europe end of chapter forty chapter forty one of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter forty one northern italy we have left venice and are riding on the railroad through the rich plains of lombardy on the north we can see the mighty snow-capped wall of the alps which shuts italy off from the other countries of europe and not far to the southward is the long range of the apennines which extends down through the peninsula clear to its foot we are travelling over some of the richest soil of all europe so rich that it produces two crops of grain every year and in the irrigated portions as much as ten crops of grass the plain of lombardy is the basin of several large rivers such as the po and the adige it is twice as large as massachusetts and about half of it is composed of irrigated lands we ride for hours through rice fields through grain fields and plantations of cotton passing many orchards and vineyards there at the right of the track they are cutting the grass the men are mowing it down with scythes and women and boys are turning it over with long poles while others are raking the dry hay together there are no mowing machines many of the fields are spaded and hoed and the ploughing is done with old-fashioned wooden ploughs tipped with iron the chief business of italy is farming the country has a great deal of excellent land there are rich valleys on both sides of the apennines and many plains upon which millions of cattle sheep goats and donkeys are pastured there are vineyards which produce grapes so abundantly that italy ranks next to france 
as the chief wine producing country of the world and there are orchards of olives oranges and lemons in almost all parts of the peninsula much of the land is owned in large tracts and let on shares in some districts the people who live in the mountains come down in families and bands to work in the harvest fields each band has its own leader who makes all the arrangements as to wages and who tells the men women and children just what they shall do the wages are very low good-sized boys and girls getting but a few cents a day but suppose we leave our train at the station and visit one of the villages to find out how the farmers live the houses are of rough stone and mortar and in some cases covered with stucco the smaller houses have but two rooms a kitchen on the ground floor and a bedroom above the floor is of brick stone or earth and everything is of the rudest description the window panes are of paper and the furniture of many a house consists of a bench two or three chairs and a table we look about in vain for beds the children sleep on the floor of the kitchen and the grown people on great sacks of straw laid on the plank floor of the room above that brick ledge at the side of the room is the cook stove those little basin-like holes in the top are for charcoal and the draught comes up through the holes in the side they are much like the stoves of the greeks the baking is usually done in an oven outside the house and such families as do not have ovens take their bread to the public bakeries as we saw them doing in greece the italian peasants live plainly their food is chiefly bread and a cornmeal mush called polenta with now and then a bit of meat or some coarse macaroni the farmer often goes out to work after eating only a piece of dry bread at eight o'clock he stops for another meal of dry bread and at eleven comes home for his breakfast of cornmeal mush and perhaps some vegetable soup at night he has a dinner of cornmeal soup or bean soup with some rice or macaroni as a rule he has meat only on feast days but he eats plenty of onions garlic and lettuce with olive oil as a dressing in some parts of italy the people eat a great quantity of chestnuts roasting them or grinding them to a meal and mixing them with flour for their bread the nuts are not so sweet as our chestnuts but they are three times as large many are bigger than horse chestnuts the houses we have described are among the poorest of italy but there are thousands like them there are also thousands of country houses much better where each family has several rooms and there are houses still larger owned by well-to-do peasants there are castles and palaces belonging to the nobility and large tenement houses in the cities where many families are crowded together each having but one or two rooms the most of the peasants are poor and their homes are little better than hovels as we travel from one part of italy to another we discover that the peasants dress differently in the different sections in lombardy they wear cotton clothing while at work in the fields many go barefooted and some wear wooden shoes not unlike those we saw in holland and belgium on sundays and feast days the young men wear clothing of wool mixed with silk many of them have jackets and knee breeches of cotton velvet hats of soft felt and thick leather shoes at such times the women wear dresses of wool or in some rare cases silk an italian woman's greatest ambition is to own a silk gown in many places the women wear square pieces of embroidered muslin on their heads instead of bonnets or hats and some have bead necklaces of gold silver or gilt the italian peasants are very good-looking the most of them having dark hair and eyes and dark rosy faces many of the poorer italians carry on some kind of work in their homes the people are very artistic and the men do beautiful carving and painting they also manufacture all sorts of small articles the women knit spin and weave and even the little children do their share of such work how would you like to raise silkworms there are more than a half a million people engaged in this business in italy and of these many thousands are little boys and girls italy produces more than one hundred and fifty million pounds of silk cocoons every year and it has a large industry in silk weaving and reeling we pass by groves of mulberry trees as we go on with our journey it is upon the leaves of these trees that the silkworms feed 
and the soil of northern italy is just right for growing them we see little children of six and eight years gathering the leaves and spreading them upon the trays where the worms are the worms bite off bits of the leaves and eat them in some places thousands of worms are feeding and as we stand and look on we can hear the chopping of their jaws as they cut up the green leaves after feeding in this way for a time the worms are ready to spin their cocoons they draw the silk out of their bodies and wrap it around and around themselves in an egg-shaped cocoon each making a little house for itself where it hopes to lie until it comes out a butterfly after the cocoons are made the people boil them to kill the worms inside and then unwind the silk and by doubling it again and again and twisting it together they make the thicker thread from which silk cloth is woven italy as we know has long been noted for its silks for you may remember we have already heard how the silk weavers of italy went to lyon france during the middle ages to make silk at the present time the best silks of europe are made in france and germany and millions of pounds of italian cocoons are shipped there every year to be turned into silks we see more people wheeling silk as we go on toward the slopes of the alps and to the beautiful italian lakes and we find great quantities of beautiful silk goods in the stores of milan and genoa we are delighted with milan for it has such a business air about it that it reminds us of our american cities it is situated in the heart of the rich plain of lombardy where it can easily be reached from northern europe by the railroad tunnels through the alps so that it has become a great commercial centre it now contains more than a half a million people and is one of the best business cities of europe it has fine buildings of marble as well as big stores broad streets and beautiful parks its people are good-looking and are noted for their wealth and fine dressing the milanese are very proud of their city and especially of their cathedral which is one of the most beautiful in the whole world the milan cathedral is a great gothic structure made of the purest white marble beautifully carved there are marble statues on every part of it so many indeed that we can count several thousands and then leave off in despair we climb up the four hundred and ninety-four steps of the tower for the magnificent view which we there get of the city the alps and the plain of lombardy and then take train for genoa the birthplace of columbus we see the monument of columbus as we leave the railroad station it is a white marble statue standing near an anchor with a marble figure kneeling before it and other figures representing america geography religion strength and wisdom sitting about columbus was born in genoa in 1436 he was the son of a wool comber but his father gave him a good education and he began life as a sailor he had already made a number of voyages when he applied to genoa for money that he might attempt to discover a new route to india by sailing to the westward but he was refused he then laid his plans before the courts of spain portugal and england and finally persuaded king ferdinand and queen isabella of spain to give him the three small ships with which he found the new world genoa in the time of columbus was a very great city it was a rival of venice and its people owned numerous islands in the mediterranean they had their factories and business houses in constantinople asia minor and along the black sea and their ships went to all parts of the known world genoa has an excellent harbor and it is to-day an important port and a great manufacturing centre it is so beautiful that its people call it la superba or the superb city the land about the harbor rises in hills which are backed by the apennines the houses cover the hills and in our walks about through the streets we seem to be always climbing up or going down the most of the buildings are large many of them were erected as palaces by the rich nobles and merchants of ancient genoa and many are now divided up into apartments so that a score of families may live in one old palace in most of the buildings the first and second floors are given up to offices and stores while the floors higher up are the dwellings some of the streets are very narrow winding about between walls a hundred feet high with breaks at the cross streets the people who live in such streets 
have no gardens and they stretch wires or ropes from building to building and from window to window to dry their washing upon them so that at times we have to walk carefully to avoid the dripping water we drive out to the aquasola the great park of genoa and afterward to the campo santo its strange cemetery where many of the monuments are statues representing the dead as they looked while alive we spend some time in the shops admiring the fine silks and velvets and the silver and gold filigree work for which the city is noted and then take a train for rome stopping at pisa leghorn and florence on the way at pisa we see the wonderful leaning tower and at leghorn watch the making of hats and straw braid at florence we visit the great cathedral the bell tower of giotto and the celebrated picture galleries which are among the finest of the world we stroll along the river arno which flows through the town and make excursions into the fertile plains of tuscany driving through vast vineyards and groves of olives and oranges the scenery is very beautiful and we regret we cannot spend months exploring the country we make an excursion however to the tiny republic of san marino situated on a rocky hill in the apennines about a half mile from the sea this republic is perhaps the smallest of the world it is only twenty-four miles square and it has a population of only about eight thousand but its inhabitants have governed themselves for hundreds of years while the other countries of europe have been governed by kings end of chapter forty one chapter forty two of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter forty two rome the capital of italy italy is shaped like a great boot about half as wide as from new york to washington and about as long as from new york to toledo the top of the boot extends out in a wide flap up the foothills of the alps and the toe looks just as though it were about to kick the island of sicily not far from the centre of the front of the boot just where the middle of the shin would be if it were a human leg a little river flows out of the apennine mountains down to the mediterranean it passes over a wide plain called the campagna and as it nears the sea it flows by seven little hills which for more than two thousand years have formed the site of one of the greatest cities of the world this river is the tiber and the city is rome the capital of italy when rome was first settled the tiber was deeper than it now is and sea-going vessels came right up to the hills the town being on the hills could be easily defended and the rich country about it was well fitted for pasture and farming there were easy ways over the mountains to other parts of italy and ships could be sent out to all the lands of the mediterranean so you see the situation of rome helped to make it a great city and the capital of italy the race which founded it was brave and warlike and it soon conquered the whole italian peninsula and made war upon nation after nation outside until in time it formed the great roman empire and became master of almost all the known world at that time the chief civilized nations lived about the mediterranean sea italy has the most central position of all countries on this sea it has excellent harbors and one of the best situations for commerce and trade the romans cultivated their territory largely by means of the slaves that they took in war and as time went on they grew richer and richer their city became not only the capital of the world but also the center of all that was inspiring in art and learning the romans had magnificent palaces and great public works their scholars wrote books which are even now studied in our colleges and their language laws and customs form a part of our civilization in time the roman empire was broken to pieces but we shall find remainders of it in the ruins which are scattered everywhere throughout the city centuries later rome came under the control of the pope the head of the catholic church this church was the chief one of europe for hundreds of years and it was the founder of another phase of civilization under it great cathedrals were built colleges were established and some of the finest of the paintings of the world were made 
we shall see evidences of all this in old rome we shall at the same time see the rome of today, the capital of modern italy and the home of the king and his parliament we leave our hotel and drive to the top of the pincian hill for a bird's-eye view of the city winding our way up over roads shaded with cypress trees and lined with gardens and beautiful flowers at the end of our drive we find ourselves on a terrace high above rome north of the city which covers the hills of the southward and fills the valley of the tiber winding along not far below us that mass of huge buildings with the high dome above them on the opposite side of the river is st peter's cathedral and the palace of the vatican where the pope lives the square at our feet with the obelisk in it is the piazza del popolo and that long straight street which cuts its way through the city dividing it almost in half is the corso one of the chief business streets of the rome of today turning to the right we see a great wall winding its irregular way about the town enclosing many ruins some rising out of gardens and vineyards that is the wall of old rome which was fourteen miles in circumference but which encloses only a part of modern rome the ruins are of wonderful interest we can see some of them from the pincian hill their vast amphitheatre beyond the buildings in front of us with its walls half in ruins is all that is left of the Colosseum, the greatest showground of all times there lions and tigers and wild beasts once fought together there half-naked men tried to kill one another with swords and spears and there men women and children were thrown to wild beasts because they were christians to give the heathen romans a holiday show a little to the left of the Colosseum is the forum where the romans held their meetings when the city was a republic and where the greatest of the roman orations were uttered it now looks more like an excavation for a building than anything else the rome of olden times was many feet below the rome of today but the forum has been dug out and it now forms a great pit filled with broken columns and blocks of marble in the heart of the city notice the great building above the forum that is the capital on the side of the citadel of old rome it is there that the italian senate meets and there also is a museum in which are some of the finest statues which have come down from old rome everywhere we turn there are so many wonderful buildings and ruins that it will be impossible for us to visit them all the city has scores of museums it has many picture galleries it has priceless collections of ancient manuscripts and is celebrated for its paintings sculpture and architecture as well as for its business and social advantages we engage carriages at the pincian hill and drive about through the streets there are many old palaces with modern buildings among them there are fine stores with plate glass windows there are street cars telegraph wires and all the appointments of our most modern cities we can hardly realize we are in a town two thousand years old we stop in the people's square and take a drink from the fountain where the water spurts forth from the mouths of the lions we pause a moment before the great obelisk from egypt and then drive on through the corso passing magnificent turnouts filled with richly dressed ladies and gentlemen the corso is crowded the better classes are dressed as we are and the people upon the streets look not unlike those of paris and london now and then we see a peasant in a cap and short jacket his trousers held up by a sash about the waist and now a rosy-cheeked maiden in short skirts with a bright handkerchief tied round her head there are peddlers going about with their wares on their heads and hucksters driving donkeys and mules there are priests everywhere walking along singly and in pairs or in processions from one part of the town to another they wear long gowns some white some black and some brown and many have high hats and cowls there are processions of nuns and sisters of charity for rome is still the chief city of the catholic church and as such it is a holy place to catholics all the world over we visit the church of st peter it is by far the largest church in the world and we feel lost within it we next wander about outside the vatican where the pope lives he has a magnificent palace with four thousand rooms and a library of one hundred thousand volumes 
including some of the most valuable manuscripts ever written some of our mornings are spent in driving about outside rome in the campagna where one day our guide takes us down under the earth into the catacombs which are vast caves and tunnels cut out of the soft volcanic rock there are miles of these tunnels some lined with cells and shelves which contain human bones they are not far from the city and were probably first dug as the burial places of the romans later on when the christians were persecuted they fled to them for refuge and lived here for years away down out of the light of the sun having their food brought in at night our guide goes in front with a light taking us through tunnel after tunnel and winding his way this way and that we follow him closely and hold tightly to one another's hands trembling at the thought of being lost away down here under the ground and of trying in vain to find our way out we visit the palaces of the king and spend some time in parliament watching the italians make laws for themselves we go to the government buildings where we discover that italy still holds an important place among the countries of europe we learn that it has a great army and navy and that its inhabitants are fast growing in intelligence although the education of the common people is still far below that of the french germans or english the law requires that all children be sent to school but it is not always enforced and many of the men and women cannot read nor write we ask as to italy's trade and are informed that it is rapidly growing and that the people are among our good customers they are importing a great deal of grain cotton and other things from america and sending back fruits and olive oil as well as silk and wool and other goods in exchange end of chapter forty two chapter forty three of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter forty three naples and mount vesuvius the italians have a saying see naples and die for they say you will then have seen the most beautiful city of the world and indeed it is beautiful the sky is almost always bright and it is nowhere brighter than at naples the mediterranean is almost always blue and at the bay of naples its color is glorious the city as it rises about the bay tier above tier seems a city of palaces there are hazy blue mountains behind it and south of it is the great brown volcano of vesuvius with its steaming cone standing out against the blue sky but let us see how it looks in the city itself we leave our hotel and climb up through the streets many of them are steep and we are always going up or downhill the high buildings are close to the sidewalks and the streets are so narrow that in places the walls shut out the sun they are not over clean and in some streets the smells are offensive the people live in flats or apartments and in the poorer quarters of the city whole families dwell in one room what curious things the people do on the streets we see men and women sitting down on the pavements making their toilets there is a woman combing her hair and here is one washing her baby there is a cobbler at his bench soling a pair of old shoes and beside him a tailor is working away what a lot of children there are everywhere there are two babies sprawling on the edge of the gutter here comes a boy of eight driving a donkey and there is another with a can in his hand pulling along two milk goats from door to door he is one of the little milkmen of the city and is probably helping his father whom we see with those goats farther on there are donkeys carrying all sorts of things here comes one loaded with fruit and behind are two others ridden by boys the donkeys are not bigger than newfoundland dogs and their ears are almost as long as their legs many of the neapolitan boys have their own donkeys as our boys sometimes have ponies do you like roasted chestnuts there are men selling them here on almost every block they have little furnaces and basins of charcoal on which they roast chestnuts out in the streets we pass fruit stands every now and then and buy delicious pears for ten cents a dozen and oranges too for a cent see the crowd of men and women about that cook stand they are buying roast sausages and stewed macaroni 
italy is famous for its macaroni and quantities of it are exported to our country every year see there is a man eating some now he twists his fork around and around in the dish and takes a great mass of it in at one gulp he does not cut it but sucks in the long strings until the whole has gone down his throat suppose we visit one of the factories and learn how macaroni is made such factories are to be seen in all parts of italy for macaroni forms a large part of the food of the people it is made in different sizes and shapes sometimes in long strings sometimes in pipes as big around as your finger and sometimes in sticks about as thick as a knitting needle the finer kinds are called vermicelli and spaghetti we see the tubes of white dough drying on the racks in front of the factory and when we go in find a score of men and boys hard at work each boy is so covered with flour that his dark rosy face looks almost ghastly in contrast with his sparkling black eyes he is in his bare feet and his sleeves are rolled up to his shoulders the men are mixing the flour into dough and kneading it with great bars so fastened to hinges that they can press the dough down on the table after it is thoroughly kneaded they carry it to a cylinder in which there are many small holes so arranged that it can be pressed through them it comes out in long pipes or sticks which the boys carry to the racks in the sun or to the hot drying rooms which some factories have for the purpose let us stroll on down to the bay it is filled with shipping for naples is the chief port of the italian peninsula and its harbor is one of the finest of europe the city is as big as st louis and has a vast trade with all parts of the mediterranean with northern europe and with north and south america it also does a great business in fish and in coral and sponges it has many fishing vessels and its people go fishing not only in the mediterranean but out to the atlantic and elsewhere but the most interesting thing about naples is not in the city itself it is the great volcano outside only a short drive away vesuvius is the only active volcano on the continent of europe and it is one of the most interesting volcanoes of the whole world it is early morning when we start out to explore it the first part of our journey is in a carriage driven by a neapolitan coachman who cracks his whip every minute and keeps his team on the gallop we rattle out of the city over pavements of lava now almost running over a baby and now making the dogs howl as with drooping tails they leap out of our way we go through small villages of lava built houses by vineyards and gardens walled with lava and then up through foothills of volcanic sand until we enter a region which is all bare brown lava there is lava everywhere and in all sorts of shapes we pass through seas and rivers of lava which once flowed like fire but which now are cold and dead and as we look up see a column of steam hanging like a gigantic umbrella over a brown lava mountain the volcano of vesuvius the mountain is perfectly bare there is not a bit of grass to be seen anywhere it is all lava ashes and volcanic sand the road going up winds in and out until it at last becomes so steep that we must leave the carriages and mount donkeys when about two thousand feet above the sea we reach the observatory where instruments are kept to register the movements of the mighty volcano how the earth rumbles it was shaking as we rode up on our donkeys and here by the instruments we can see just what motion is going on away down in the heart of the mountain the director of the observatory informs us that vesuvius is always more or less active but that there is no present danger he describes the first recorded eruption telling us how a little more than eighteen hundred years ago the volcano was covered with farms the slopes being cultivated almost to the top then there were vineyards all over the land where the lava and ashes now are and hot springs on the edge of the mountains where the rich romans came for their health and for sport there were beautiful towns on the plains near by and among others the two fashionable resorts of pompeii and herculaneum pompeii contained about twenty five thousand people it was a rich resident city and its inhabitants had beautiful homes temples and theatres the rich were living in fine style giving parties and dinners and driving about in their chariots 
with gay prints and horses the poor were at work at their trades the merchants were selling goods in the stores the children were going to school and all sorts of business were being carried on when one day without warning the great mountain burst forth sending vast volumes of steam ashes burning rocks and mud high into the air there were so many ashes that they darkened the sun and turned the day into night even at rome hundreds of miles to the northward the sun was hidden the people thought that the end of the world had come and that an age when it would be always night had set in at the same time it rained mud and rivers of boiling hot mud flowed out of the crater down over the plain the horses sheep and cattle which were pasturing there were drowned the fields the vineyards and gardens were covered and in the towns even the tallest buildings were soon buried they all disappeared and the region became a great plain of ashes and mud as time went on new towns grew up on the plains and crops of all kinds were raised there the buried cities were blotted out of the memory of man as the volcano had blotted them from the face of the earth so it remained until a little more than a hundred and fifty years ago when a peasant who was digging a well struck his spade against a statue he dug it out and soon it was found that there was a city down there buried under the earth the government of italy took possession of the place and for years it has had men at work unearthing the city the scholars began to investigate the history of the region and it was found that the site of the lost city of pompeii had been discovered the great eruption occurred in the latter part of the first century of our era and for a long time thereafter the volcano lay quiet during the eighteenth century there was another terrible eruption and in eighteen twenty two the whole top of the mountain burst off and formed a great chasm three miles in circumference and about half a mile deep since then other eruptions have caused streams of lava to flow out of the crater until now vesuvia seems to be only a vast mass of lava rock sand and ashes leaving the observatory we again mount our donkeys and make our way up the mountain at last we reach the station from where we are to ride up to the crater by rail the railroad is a little like the one up pike's peak but more like one of our cable car lines the track has three rails one in the centre which supports the weight of the car and others at each side for the guiding wheels which keep the car from jumping the track the cable attached to the car runs around a wheel at the top of the mountain and is moved by an engine at the station below the sides of the car are open and we get a magnificent view of the mediterranean as we rise through the volcanic sand up the steep mountain we go rapidly upward and at last we stop near the crater over four thousand feet above the sea here we hire other guides and pick our way over the thin coating of lava to the mouth of the volcano the air is hot and full of sulphur fumes we cough and hold our handkerchiefs to our faces in a vain effort to keep out the fumes the wind is blowing the steam away from the crater and we walk carefully over the crust and look down into a vast pit walled with yellow sulphur in the bottom of which a lake of fire is seething sending up steam ashes brimstone and rocks now it seems to be quiet and now it bursts forth throwing stones high up into the air they fall back and we can hear them splash away down there in the crater but now the wind changes it is rising into a gale and the stones are falling almost at our feet our guides drag us back and hurry us away for fear we may all be killed by the burning hot stones this is only a gentle eruption when the great outbursts occur the noise is like that of a battle and rocks weighing many tons are shot upwards for hundreds of feet about fifty years ago twenty sightseers were killed where we now stand by a sudden eruption of lava pieces of rock being thrown a mile high at such times the steam rises to a height of more than two miles and the whole mountain is covered by an umbrella of ashes and vapor more than five miles in height how warm the earth is we dare not stand still we seem to be walking upon a hot stove we smell our shoes burning we bend down and touch the lava with our fingers but draw them away quickly smarting with the heat one of the guides asks us to look at the cracks in the earth 
and we see golden streams of molten lava flowing through them under our feet he thrusts an iron rod into one of the cracks and brings out a lump of the red-hot metal he asks us for a penny and he presses it into the mass with a stick he then drops the lava off the rod into a bucket of water which a boy has brought up the water hisses and steams but the lava soon cools and the guide takes it out our penny is now embedded in the lava like a raisin in a bun and we take it home as a relic but see the boy is pulling some eggs out of his pocket he points to the water and offers to cook them for us he rests the bucket over a wide crack where the molten lava is not far from the surface the intense heat soon boils the water and the eggs are cooked hard we carry them with us back down the mountain and eat them with our lunch at the railroad station below priding ourselves that we are among the few americans who have eaten eggs cooked on a volcano we then ride back to the carriages and drive over the plain to the site of the once buried city of pompeii there is a great wall about it made of the ashes and stones which have been already dug out and we find many boys and men digging and carrying the stuff out in baskets on their backs and their heads a large part of pompeii is already uncovered and we walk through streets walled with the curious buildings which were blotted out by vesuvius eighteen hundred years ago the earth and ashes have so preserved the buildings that they look to-day almost as they did at the time of the eruption the roadways are paved with stone and in some of them we can see the ruts made by the wheels of the chariots we walk through the amphitheatre where the people had their shows and sit down on the marble seats of the bathhouses where the boys of pompeii sat when they had finished their baths centuries ago we wander about through the houses peopling them with their old roman owners many buildings are of brick and many of stone they are nearly all of one or two stories and some are very large they had wooden roofs which were burned off by the ashes many of the houses have walls covered with paintings and in some beautiful statues in bronze and marble were found some had fine paintings and all sorts of beautiful things in metals and carvings the floors of many were formed of different colored stones fitted together in mosaic pictures and the latin word salve or welcome was carved over their doors while in one entrance floor there was a mosaic picture of a fierce dog gnashing his teeth and tugging at a rope as though he wished to get at you while at his feet were the words cave canem or beware of the dog we are interested in the business parts of pompeii where there are streets of shops with marble counters where the merchants were selling their goods when the mighty volcanic flood came we peep into a public bake oven in which black loaves of burnt bread were found when the mud and ashes were first dug away we see casts of men women and children and even of dogs made by pouring plaster of paris into the holes which their bodies formed in the ashes and when we again visit the museum of naples we are shown cooking utensils toilet articles rings earrings and bracelets fish hooks and knives and thousands of other articles of every description all in common use among these people when without warning they were destroyed by the ashes and boiling mud of the terrible mountain end of chapter forty three chapter forty four of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter forty four rural spain we have crossed the mediterranean sea from naples to barcelona and are now traveling over the highlands of spain the country is different from any we have yet visited the sun is wonderfully bright there are few clouds the air is dry and the weather is hot we are now on the great peninsula which forms the end of southwestern europe comprising the kingdoms of spain and portugal it begins at the pyrenees and extends so close to africa that we could go from gibraltar to that continent in a small boat in a very few hours the spanish peninsula is twice as large as great britain and larger than either germany or france it is a high plateau crossed by many ranges of snow-clad mountains with rich valleys and dreary plains lying among them 
it has but few navigable rivers and although it is washed on almost all sides by the sea its coasts are so steep that it has very few harbors on the plateau the winters are cold and the summers exceedingly hot and in the far south it is so warm that bananas dates and other tropical fruits can be grown we reach the hills soon after leaving barcelona and ride for miles in the mountains now passing through forests and now crawling along above magnificent valleys with their many-colored crops spread out like a vast quilt below us now our train flies by orange groves and now through a country where for miles there are olive groves we enter dense woods of chestnuts and oaks and spend days upon high plains where vast flocks of sheep are grazing watched by queerly dressed shepherds assisted by dogs the sheep are the famous spanish merinos this breed of sheep has been introduced into australia argentina and the other great sheep raising parts of the world there are many small towns with stone or brick buildings covered with stucco and roofed with red tiles there are numerous villages in which the farmers live going out to their work in the fields sometimes their farms are so far away that they use donkeys to ride back and forth the roads are poor and in the mountains everything is carried about on the backs of donkeys and mules see that fat farmer riding up the road at the side of the track he is as big as his donkey and his long legs almost touch the ground as he urges the little beast onward he wears a broad-brimmed sharp-crowned hat and has a great cloak on his shoulders farther down the road is a donkey carrying two little boys and still farther on a drove of donkeys loaded with grain each having a bag on his back they have neither bridles nor saddles and are being driven by a rosy-cheeked barefooted boy in the rear behind comes a boy with a cart load of grass he is leading a little donkey which is drawing the cart we see donkeys laden with fruit and donkeys so covered with loads of hay that the hay seems to be walking off on four legs there are also mules similarly loaded and the whole of this part of spain seems to be going muleback or donkeyback now we have left the mountains and are out on the plains see the huge ox carts lumbering along the wide roads some of them are piled high with grain the oxen are yoked to the tongue of the cart by a bar which rests on their necks and is fastened to their horns so that they pull the loads along with their heads and not with the shoulders as our oxen do notice the man ploughing in that field over there he is goading his oxen along with a stick with a sharp pointed steel in the end how simple the plough is it is only a piece of rough wood tipped with iron and it merely scratches the soil that is a fair sample of the farm tools of the country more than half of the spaniards are farmers but they farm very poorly they raise quantities of wheat barley corn and rye but they do not get half so much out of the land as they might with better tools a large part of spain is so dry that little will grow upon it but there are irrigated provinces which are exceedingly fertile and yield abundant crops they produce the finest of olives and grapes oranges and lemons and all sorts of vegetables take for instance the lands near the mediterranean sea about malaga in southeastern spain in that region are grown the big green grapes sold in our stores the soil of the vineyards is of a bright red color and it is so rich that every bit of it is used the vines are planted in terraces up the sides of the hills in regular rows and only a few feet apart they are carefully tended and a little trench is dug about each vine to catch the water when it rains the grapes are packed in cork dust and thus shipped to all parts of europe and to the united states other varieties are made into raisins and hundreds of thousands of pounds of large muscatel raisins are exported every year from malaga bay in other provinces wine is made in large quantities and in some regions there are so many vineyards that we are reminded of our travels through the wine country of france north of the pyrenees another fruit of great value to spain is the olive there are olive orchards everywhere and at one place we leave the train to visit a hacienda where they are picking the fruit and turning it into the oil we use on our salads the old spaniard who owns the farm bids us welcome 
as we walk along with him he tells us that his house is at our disposition and that his orchard is ours the olive trees are much like plum trees save that they are knotty and gnarly and their leaves are a darker green on some of them the fruit has a pale green color like the olives sold in our grocery stores such fruit is not yet ripe but it is pulled off at this stage and salted for eating on other trees the olives are a dark glossy purple they are ripe and it is of them that they are making the oil there are men shaking the trees and knocking the fruit off with clubs and rosy-cheeked barefooted bareheaded children are gathering the olives from the ground and putting them into the bags and baskets in which they are carried upon donkeys and mules to the mill there is a man starting off for the mill he has a half dozen donkeys each carrying a two bushel bag the proprietor asks us to go with him and we follow the donkeys to a rude building in which a mule is dragging one stone shaped like a wheel around through a circular trough or groove in the top of another stone which lies flat this is the grinding machine the olives are put into the trough in the flat stone and the wheel crushes them to a pulp as it rolls over them after being crushed the olives are laid on straw mats and these mats are placed one upon another in a press where by means of a long heavy beam in the top as a lever the oil is squeezed out into a rude tank below water is mixed with the pulp in order to make the oil flow the more easily the liquid that comes out is made up of water and oil but the oil rises to the top and is skimmed off the squeezed pulp is kept for fattening hogs and the oil having been cleared is put into bottles for sale only the best of the oil is fit for the table the poorer kinds being used for cooking this olive plantation is not one of the finest but it is a fair type of the plantations of spain there are many other estates where the olives are more carefully picked and handled on such farms the fruit is pressed only lightly at first to get out the best oil afterwards it is ground up and mixed with boiling water and pressed again upon inquiring we learn that olives grow in most parts of spain and that they are used everywhere by the people about one-thirtieth of all the fertile land of the country is devoted to olive raising and the orchards cover more than two million acres the trees are well tilled they have their first fruit when two years old and continue to bear for so long a time that the people have this saying if you would give a lasting fortune to your children's children you have only to plant olive trees for them the spaniards use olive oil largely in cooking we see the people eating it on bread and vegetables and are told that it is cream and butter to many of the people as well as their favorite dressing for salads it takes the place of meat also and many a spaniard when he takes a long journey hangs a wicker basket of olives to his saddle horn and eats them as he rides we are delighted with the country people of spain the men women and children are polite and they wear such gay costumes that we have a new picture wherever we look many of the men wear blankets about their shoulders they have broad-brimmed hats with sharp conical tops and short jackets and knee breeches their legs below the knees being covered with stockings or wrapped around with rags they wear sandals or queer-looking shoes there are many beautiful women some of the peasant girls have caps with tassels so long that they hang down their shoulders on sunday they wear dresses of black velvet over which they drape striped shawls of bright colors their skirts are short some have gaiters laced up to their knees and others wear stockings bound with ribbons crossed over and over in the fields we see barefooted women with handkerchiefs on their heads and farther south are many dark-faced peasant men in turbans spain has a large variety of strange costumes nearly every province having a dress of its own in the larger cities the people look much as we do save that the men often wear cloaks and the women have on mantillas or veils instead of bonnets they usually wear black gowns when out on the street the spaniards are a fine-looking race and their women are famous for their beauty the most of them have dark rosy faces dark hair and dark eyes although now and then you meet a beautiful blonde they age rapidly however the poor through hard work and the rich through idleness 
the women of the upper classes take so little exercise that when middle aged they become fat and dumpy we are much annoyed by beggars as we travel through spain and we observe that there are many poor people the peasants live simply their chief food is bread and olives although they sometimes have eggs or pork or goat's meat they are fond of salt fish and salt meat and with their neighbors the portuguese are the greatest codfish eaters of the whole world the living at the hotels is fairly good although the breakfasts are scanty when we rise in the morning we have only a little cup of chocolate or coffee with bread and butter this meal is called desayuno about noon we have a breakfast of eggs fish and stew and at the end of the day a very good dinner one of the most common dishes is puchero a vegetable soup cooked with boiled beef or fowl the soup is served first and then the meat and vegetables which were cooked in it are brought on after this we have some kind of fried meat or croquettes and then perhaps fish and after the fish a dessert and fruit ending our meal with cheese and black coffee we are surprised to see the men everywhere smoking at their meals they light their cigars and cigarettes even when the women are present and we are horrified at times to see a woman take a cigarette and smoke with them this is not common in public although many of the spanish women smoke in their homes after dinner the people sit about the table and chat and it is the same at the midday breakfast or luncheon all business in spain stops from noon until two o'clock in order that the people may get their breakfast and have their siesta or their rest or sleep after it this seems lazy to us but in spain the climate is so warm that it is not well for men to work in the middle of the day end of chapter forty four chapter forty five of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter forty five in the cities of spain only a small proportion of the spaniards live in large towns the most of them are farmers and fruit growers whose homes are in villages scattered at wide distances apart over the country the chief cities with the exception of madrid which is in the middle of the plateau a half mile above the sea are along the sea coast or in the river valleys of the high plains where the water can be used for irrigation the cities of the northern provinces are somewhat like the other cities of europe take for instance barcelona where we landed at the close of our voyage from naples it is as large as baltimore and has fine stores theatres and many cafes it is the chief business city of spain having an excellent harbor with a rich country behind it its chief street the ramble running up from the wharves is wide and lined with rows of trees furnishing magnificent shade barcelona has electric lights street cars and business buildings and houses which would do credit to any great city madrid the spanish capital contains over a half million people it is a great square town made up of immense square buildings surrounded by a wall twelve miles in length it is the highest of the european capitals and is situated almost in the centre of the plateau with dreary plains reaching out for miles on every side the climate is far from delightful it is so bad that its citizens are said to live in an ice-house for three months of the year and in a furnace for the other nine months we spend a week in madrid and although it is summer find it by no means uncomfortable we follow the custom of the spanish and take a siesta in the middle of the day driving about during the mornings and evenings we usually start out on our excursions from the puerto del sol this is the chief public square of the city and one of the liveliest places in europe it is of the shape of a half moon surrounded by high buildings with ten wide avenues opening into it from here all the street cars start and here we can get cabs to take us to any part of the city we enjoy the strange sights of the square there are carriages of rich spaniards coming in and going out of it in every direction there are donkeys and mules loaded with all sorts of goods passing through and now and then we see a regiment of soldiers moving across to the music of a band the streets about the puerto del sol 
are usually crowded there are many well-dressed men and many women in black gowns wearing black shawls over their heads there are priests and monks in big hats and long gowns of various colors some with cowls which hang far down their backs there are sober-faced nuns and sisters of charity and now and then a band of schoolboys walking along under the charge of a priest the spaniards are almost all roman catholics and in many of the schools the priests are the teachers then there are newsboys shouting their papers peddlers selling lottery tickets milkmen and men of all trades in the evenings there are many people in cafes reading chatting or playing dominoes and scores of promenaders on the streets laughing and chatting with one another every sunday afternoon during our stay in madrid there is a bullfight in the great ring which the people have built for such shows we are urged to attend but we refuse we do not approve of bullfighting and we certainly would not go to a show on sunday nevertheless we cannot help learning a great deal about the sport for at times our spanish friends will talk of nothing but bulls and bullfighting attending such shows is the favorite amusement of the spaniards and a great bullfight here will attract more spectators than will gather to see a baseball match between champion teams in one of our cities all the large towns of spain have their bull rings and hundreds of bulls are killed in them every year much of the fighting is upon horses and as many as five thousand horses have been gored to death in one season at such fights the wildest and fiercest bulls that can be found are brought into the circus this is a big ring with walls about it above which are the seats for the people in madrid many thousands attend and men women and children of all classes are among the spectators we are told that even the women and girls clap their hands as they watch their favorite actors torturing the poor animals to death the fighters are both on foot and on horseback they are dressed in gay costumes each having his hair done up in a knot at the back of the neck the men on foot have red blankets which they shake in front of the bull as soon as he enters the ring to enrage him as the animal darts for them they jump to one side and when he turns about they again shake the red the color which every bull hates in his face the men on horseback tease him with sharp lances and as he grows angry the men on foot throw sharp arrows decorated with bright colored ribbons into his shoulders or back the arrows have sharp points barbed like a fish hook so that they cannot come out and the ribbons tied to their shafts wave gaily as the tormented bull runs around the ring after a time even the quietest animal can be made angry by such treatment the beast soon becomes wild with rage he darts after the men on horseback and tries to drive his horns into their steeds sometimes a horse is thrown to the ground and its rider gored to death when the bull has reached this angry state one of the men on foot tries to kill him by stabbing him with a sword if he makes just the right stroke he can drop him dead to the ground but in many cases the poor beast is stabbed again and again after the bull is killed a team of horses is hitched to its horns and the band plays while it is dragged out and another victim brought in we spend some time visiting the great museums and art galleries for which madrid is noted and at the palace and in the government departments learn about the country spain is ruled by a king and a parliament the lower house of which is elected by the people the government of spain has been bad in times past and this is one reason why the spaniards are poor both in city and country civilization is backward and the common people are so ignorant that only one in every four can read and write spain has but few railroads and although it has much good land and many rich mines of iron copper zinc quicksilver and lead it is poor and the government is greatly in debt its resources are little developed and it is not increasing in population and wealth like many of the other parts of europe this is partly due to the character of the spaniards who were so enriched by the countries they obtained through the discoveries of columbus and others that they became lazy extravagant and cruel for people rarely make good use of wealth they have not earned the spaniards then secured fortunes without working for them and became the richest nation of europe spain owned almost all south america with the exception of brazil 
and all central america and mexico as well as the west indies and the philippine islands she enslaved the natives and brought gold and silver by the shipload home from those countries she established colonies in them but oppressed the people so that they rebelled and one by one broke away from her and now spain has no colonies of any importance from madrid we travel by rail visiting the various provinces of the kingdom we find that each state has the general spanish characteristics but that the people of the different sections each have ways and customs of their own the spaniards are made up of several race elements owing to the fact that the country has been overrun again and again by other races spain was conquered by the carthaginians and afterwards was long held by the romans these in turn were overthrown by the goths from the north in the eighth century the moors crossed the strait of gibraltar from africa and drove out the goths the spanish of today are the result of the intermingling of these different races they resemble the italians and french more closely than they do the anglo-saxons and germans the people are proud and patriotic and very hospitable in manner if we admire anything in the hands of a spaniard he straightway offers it to us knowing we shall refuse to accept it and whenever we visit at any man's house he tells us that the house is ours we make one trip northward into the provinces where the basques live on the edge of the pyrenees these people are among the best of the spaniards being descended from the earliest inhabitants the basques are noted for their thrift their country is rich in minerals especially in iron and coal much of which is exported from the port of bilbao on the bilbao river not far from the bilbao bay another excursion is made to valencia the great silk and wine port of the mediterranean and afterward we go westward and visit cordoba granada and seville in this region the people are somewhat darker and we see many who remind us somewhat of the people of turkey the houses are different and some of the cities are like parts of constantinople this region was long in the hands of the moors a race of warlike mohammedans who crossed the narrow strait of gibraltar and conquered the country pushing their rule so far north that for a time the french had the proverb africa begins at the pyrenees the moors held southern spain for several centuries and established their own civilization in it they were among the ablest and most learned people of their time they built great cities in spain and among them cordoba which at one time had almost one million inhabitants it had hundreds of public schools and a great university it had one hundred public baths and one hundred mosques the ruins of the greatest of which are still standing we visit these ruins and stroll about through the forest of columns which upheld the great roof we enter the catholic cathedral which has been built inside the mosque and then stroll out into the narrow dirty streets of the cordoba of today the great glory of the ancient moorish city has long since passed away its population has dwindled to fifty thousand and it now ranks with the smaller cities of spain still it has houses which make you think of its past many of them are of moorish architecture with lattice-work balconies and with iron bars over the windows and doors in granada not far away we explore the ruins of the alhambra the huge red stone palace where the moorish kings lived and then go on to seville here there is another great moorish palace the alcazar and also many beautiful moorish houses with walls painted in the brightest colors and windows heavily barred each is built about a court in which oranges grow and cool fountains play there are date trees on the edge of the city and in the country about groves of oranges and lemons and other tropical fruits there are tobacco plantations and we are shown a tobacco factory employing five thousand women which is said to be the largest in europe seville is situated at the head of the navigation of the guadalquivir river and hence has a large trade there are steamers loading oranges and lemons at the wharves and we take passage on one of the orange steamers we float down the guadalquivir through a beautiful and almost tropical country and at last come to cadiz the chief spanish port on the atlantic cadiz is situated on a beautiful bay and is surrounded by villages it is one of the oldest settlements in europe 
having been a thriving port in the days of the phoenicians as well as in the times of the greeks and the romans we find many ships in its harbor and take passage on one for gibraltar for we wish to see this great english fortress at the entrance to the mediterranean before leaving spain the voyage is a short one and we are soon landed at the foot of the enormous bare rock commanding the strait we can see the forts before we come to it two thousand big cannon are looking at us out of its sides and it fairly bristles with batteries and fortifications this rock belongs to england and although it is so small that you could walk around it in less than two hours it is one of the most important forts of the world it is the key to the mediterranean sea and through it to the suez canal and is of the greatest value in protecting the english ships which must go through on their way to and from asia australia and the mediterranean ports the english have also a naval station and a coaling port here there is a good harbor at the foot of the rock and upon it a town of about thirty thousand people including spaniards greeks arabians italians africans and english we are met by english officers as we step from our steamer and are delighted as we stroll about through the town to meet many people who can speak our own language the english keep several thousand soldiers at gibraltar all the year round and the king of england appoints a governor who has charge of the colony and who is also commander-in-chief of the fort End of chapter forty five chapter forty six of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter forty six the kingdom of portugal how our hearts jump as we go to the shipping office near the wharves of gibraltar and take passage for london our long tour is now about over and we shall soon be crossing the atlantic for dear old america we have already travelled through every country in europe except the little kingdom of portugal and of this we shall see something while our steamer stops to take on cargo at lisbon and oporto on its way north portugal is like spain in that it is generally mountainous but it has also many rich plains it is almost as large as indiana but it has far less arable land it is noted for its fine fruit its great vineyards and forests of the oak whose bark furnishes the cork of commerce it raises many cattle and sheep and thousands of hogs are fed on the acorns which grow in the woods much wheat corn barley and rye are raised in the valleys although not enough to feed all the people it is a land of flowers and roses bloom all the year round the breezes from the mountains and ocean make it cooler than spain so that in many parts of the country the climate is delightful portugal has several good harbors and as most of its people live near the coast they are a great seafaring nation they early took to trading and in the middle ages their ships sailed to africa to england and to all parts of the mediterranean the portuguese were the first to explore the west coast of africa and bartholomew diaz a portuguese sea captain was the first white man to reach the cape of good hope this was five years before columbus discovered america and ten years later vasco da gama another portuguese made the first voyage around africa to india the most of the eastern coast of south america was discovered by portuguese it was a portuguese explorer ferdinand magellan who in fifteen twenty sailed up the rio de la plata and then after passing through the strait of magellan at the southern extremity of the continent crossed the pacific and discovered the philippine islands where he was killed some of magellan's ships sailed on around the cape of good hope to europe and thus made the first voyage clear around the world at that time the portuguese went everywhere and portugal established colonies in south america india and other places so that today there are more people who speak portuguese outside portugal than in that country itself in south america for example brazil a state more than eighty times as large as portugal is inhabited by almost three times as many people it is but a short voyage from gibraltar to lisbon and we are soon steaming in through the mouth of the tagus river and up to the city which is twelve miles back from the coast 
the river widens within a short distance from its mouth and it is so broad and deep in front of the city that it forms one of the best harbors of europe it is visited by vessels from all parts of the world we sail through shipping all the way up the river the banks are high and steep and upon them massive buildings painted in the brightest of colors show out through the trees there are castles and churches on the tops of the hills and beyond them are the ragged sintra mountains with their peaks in the sky lisbon and its suburbs border the tagus for more than nine miles the buildings extending for three miles back from the river the city has a population of about four hundred thousand and it looks quite imposing as we steam up to the wharves landing we stroll about through the streets some of them are wider than the best avenues of our american cities they are lined with trees and have excellent pavements the buildings are large two and three story structures of gray stone or of brick covered with stucco and many of them are painted in the most delicate tints of red blue and yellow so that the city looks fresh and gay the people are as gay as their homes they are well dressed and wear clothes of bright colors many of the men have suits of white linen with hats of white straw and the women wear brighter colors than the women of spain the portuguese are somewhat like the spaniards but not so tall or so heavily built their faces are darker and we frequently meet one as dark as a mulatto we now and then see a negro among them for the portuguese were great slave traders in the past they took cargoes of negroes from africa to brazil and some were brought here to portugal how many queer characters there are on the street we meet peddlers going about with boxes and baskets on their heads crying their wares there are men upon horseback and ladies in carriages there are scores of donkeys some ridden by men and others driven along loaded with bags baskets and even with stones we see many priests and nuns for the country is catholic and there are churches and monasteries in all of its towns we pass fountains at every few steps there are more than thirty in lisbon all fed by a great aqueduct which conducts water from the hills eight miles away each fountain is surrounded by men women and children who are filling stone jars and casks and carrying them off on their heads to their homes many of the water carriers are spaniards from the province of galicia who have hired themselves out as servants to the portuguese after our walk we visit the library of lisbon which contains three hundred thousand volumes and then spend some time in the government offices we learn that portugal has a king and a parliament the lower house of which is elected by the people we find that the country is backward in its adoption of modern improvements it has but few railroads and not more than one-third of the people can read and write the chief business is farming although in the north there are many cotton mills which make gay colored calicoes for the african trade later we leave lisbon for a trip through the rich valley of the tagus this river rises in spain and after leaving the mountains flows through plains of great fertility down to the sea dividing portugal into two almost equal parts there are windmills on all sides of us as we ride up the valley we pass bullock carts dragging great loads over the highways and donkeys and mules jogging along with brushwood timber and bags of grain on their backs there are women and men at work in the fields we stop to lunch in an orange grove picking the ripe juicy fruit from the trees and as we near the mountains we pass by many large vineyards we are especially interested in cork trees from whose bark comes the stoppers used in bottles all over the world there are thousands of acres of such trees in portugal and spain some wild and some in cultivated groves the cork tree is an evergreen oak which when full grown is forty or fifty feet high and sometimes as much as five feet in thickness the corks are made from the bark which is so soft that it can be easily cut into shape the bark grows very slowly a tree must be fifteen years old before its bark becomes an inch or so thick and ready for cutting after this if the bark is properly taken off the tree will grow a new coat every eight or ten years for more than a century in taking the bark two rings are cut around the tree one just above the ground and one below the main branches between these cuts are made lengthwise just deep enough 
not to enter the innermost bark and the strips are pried off after stripping the bark is flattened out by heating it over a fire it is scraped and cleaned and hardened by boiling or steaming and then it is ready to be shipped to the markets the bark is used for making bottle stoppers cork legs hat linings the soles of shoes life preservers and many other things the cork of portugal is so valuable that it brings in more than three million dollars a year being next to wine the chief export of the country we find men loading cork on our steamer when we get back to lisbon and as we sail out of the harbor towards the stormy atlantic we rejoice in the fact that we have so much cork on board that if our ship should be wrecked we could not possibly sink we stay only a short time in oporto the great wine city of portugal loading a cargo of sherry and port and then steam on to london here we remain a few days to repack our baggage and complete our list of presents for our dear friends at home and then having finished our long tour of europe take a train for liverpool where one of the fastest of the great ocean greyhounds is waiting to carry us back to new york end of chapter forty six recording by betty b end of geographic reader europe by frank g carpenter